Hey guys, welcome to another video tutorial on our physics series. And this time we're going to be looking at chapter 5.2.2. And we're going to be focusing on circuits and resistance. This is going to be part one of the series because uh, this chapter is actually quite big. So we'll be breaking this apart. Um, our first learning objective today is to look at Ohm's law. And we'll be talking about Ohm's law in more detail next time. But uh, I just wanted to introduce that idea for today. <clears throat> so a potential difference applied across two points of a resistor will create a current flow. This current flow is inversely proportional to the resistance of the resistor. So uh, we can summarize the idea of potential difference as voltage and current as, well, current is current, I. And this is uh, inversely proportional to our resistance, meaning as resistance increases, current will decrease. And this is the form of Ohm's law that is given in your textbook. Uh, you can, of course, rearrange this as you like. On the side, you can find um, the three different variables that we're using, what they are, as well as the units of measurement that are commonly used. One thing to really keep in mind here is that current is determined by, so I'm sort of reading this backwards, current is determined by the voltage and the resistance. That means um, essentially voltage and resistance are the main sort of independent variables, if you might think about that, in terms of our uh, investigation. Uh, and they, in many ways, control the flow of current. So let's have a look at this relationship of voltage, current, and resistance. So this is just a different way of representing Ohm's law. So voltage we're not going to talk about for now. Uh, so we're focusing mostly on current and resistance. So um, what we're seeing here is a bird's eye view of a river where from this end is uphill, so the river's flowing downhill, and we have a dam acting like a resistor, and it's limiting the current flow, okay? So before, we might have a larger current, okay? And you can think about current as, like, obviously, like, water current as well. So this might be, like, 3 amps. This might be, like, 1 amp, okay? So the resistor limits uh, the current flow. Here we have another idea uh, where uh, some of you guys might come across Wang Chopang through the Aberdeen Tunnel uh, into Causeway Bay, maybe to go home. And Aberdeen Tunnel, in many ways, acts as a resistor because it limits the flow of traffic. And so it's very common to have a traffic jam either entering from Causeway Bay through Aberdeen Tunnel going backwards, or if you're exiting Wang Chopang into Causeway Bay, there can be a, a bottleneck there as well. So the reason for the bottleneck is obvious because the, the tunnel itself can only have so many lanes. And so it acts very much like a resistor, limiting the flow of traffic or current flow, if we think about electricity. Now, um, electricity and current flow is maybe a little bit more intelligent, you can say, in some ways. So if it detects that there is a resistor. So if it detects the existence of a resistor here, so even though the resistor isn't placed throughout the entire circuit, um, it won't send more current than can flow through that resistor. So that's why you can only see one lane of electrons, if you will, as opposed to having multiple electrons here. Um, this is useless because Essentially, it's going to bottleneck there anyways, so it's actually better off without those electrons there. Okay, So in that way, the current is consistent throughout the entire circuit. Um, next up, we're going to look at the study of resistivity. So in terms of the learning objective, there's sort of two sub-learning objectives here. There's the definition of resistivity, and then how that's relevant in terms of our calculations. So in terms of what resistivity is, 
it's the natural tendency of the material itself, independent of its size or dimension, the, its ability to resist uh, the flow of current. So something that is a good conductor like copper has very low resistivity, whereas uh, objects like rubber have very high resistivity. This can be found in your uh, table here. Uh, this is in Cognity, so this is from figure three. So you can see something like quartz has extremely high resistivity, makes a very good conduct, sorry, it makes a very good insulator. And something like copper has very low resistivity. So we can actually see that silver is actually a better conductor compared to copper. Next up, we're going to look at the uh, calculation part of it. So in relation to a physical manifestation, we, we have to think about, um, when we talk about the resistance of the object, we consider other things like the area, the length, so more of a three-dimensional approach. And so the resistivity is the uh, resistance per unit length. Whoops, got the eraser on. Resistance per unit length of the material with the unit cross-section. And so here we have the units. And here we have the variables. And as you can see, because we have meter and meter squared here, it actually simplifies down to an ohm meter in terms of what resistivity can represent. Um, so that's uh, it's nice and handy to, to simplify that. Okay, But the full version is that it's area over length, but the shorthand version for the units is ohms, ohm meter. Um, the other thing to keep in mind here is that when we look at area, because we're looking at a circular object, we're looking at a wire. So we tend to look at the area tends to be pi r squared. So you may not be given the area directly, but rather you might be given the radius. Then you have to solve for the area, and then you can solve for the other variables. Um, so anyways, the length is the length of the wire. Area is the area or the, the cross-sectional area of the wire. Okay. And the resistivity depends on the material, right? Remember, it's independent. It's completely, sorry, independent of its dimensions. It's purely based on the material itself. Now, again, in Cognity, um, figure four is a really, really good example to show you um, what higher and lower resistivity look like. Now, it's not working very well on my iPad, but I encourage you guys to look at this um, uh, on your own computers and to study that particular figure, right? Do your own experiments, play around increasing and decreasing certain uh, independent variables and see how it's affecting things. So let's get into some calculations and um, we need to determine the resistance of the following thing. So we have a piece of copper, it's one meter long. So L is one meter, that's nice. Um, radius is one millimeter. So radius is one millimeter, which means we've got to use that to calculate the area, pi r squared. And uh, we're given that this is copper. So roll, uh, roll is the value of copper. I'm going to go look that up right now. So 1.68 times 10 to the minus 8. There's 10 minus 8. So we're going to substitute all this in. So roll is, or sorry, no, we have roll. We're trying to solve for um, the resistance, aren't we? So let's rearrange the formula and then make our substitutions. And area, pi r squared. Uh, over length. And so uh, I'm going to grab my calculator. And we're probably uh, expecting a fairly low number because this is uh, a good conductor of electricity. Times pi. Times the radius squared. And I don't need to divide by the one meter. So we got about 5.3, 5.27. So I'm just going to round that up to 
times 10 to the minus 14. So that seems pretty good. Seems about right to me. Okay, second question, we have a rubber coating on the copper wire. And so it's also one millimeter thick, which means essentially, well, this diagram isn't too accurate, I guess, is it? Because the, the radius here is one millimeter. And uh, the coating is also meant to be one millimeter as well. So uh, in terms of our material, we're looking at the rubber coating. So we need the role for rubber, which is approximately 10 to the power of 3. No, 13, isn't it? 10 to the power of 13, yeah, okay. And um, our area is going to be the difference of the two. So we're going to do the full area, pi r squared of 2 millimeters. And then we'll have to subtract that from the original 1 millimeter squared. So that's looking like it's going to be pi times, uh, that's going to be 3 millimeters squared then. No, pi times three millimeters, right? Yeah. And um, the length is still the same, one millimeter. Okay, so let's do this. Um, R equals to roll area over length. And this time we're looking at rubber, 10 to the power of three. Area is pi three millimeters. So I already did that calculation. And uh, one millimeter. Okay, let's punch this in. 10 to the power of 3. No, it was 13, wasn't it? Sorry. 13 times pi times 0 0.003. I'm just converting that into meters. And so we get 9.4 times 10 to the power of 10. Okay, and rubber is an insulator, so it's meant to have a high resistance. So that sort of checks out. Okay, our last learning objective is to look at ideal and non-ideal ammeters and voltmeters. So non-ideal is essentially the opposite so of the following thing. So an ideal ammeter has negligible resistance. So therefore, a, um, a non-ideal one would have very high resistance. The same is true for voltmeter. So of an ideal voltmeter has infinite resistance or very high resistance and so therefore an, a non-ideal one would have very low resistance. Um, this is actually related to Kirchhoff's law that we studied last time and so you can see I've kind of got these blue and pink markers to kind of help you guys uh, identify the common things that are associated with that particular law. Now current uh, has to be constant in the series circuit and this sort of comes from Kirchhoff's first law. Likewise, voltage is constant in a parallel circuit. But one of the most important things that is sort of independent of both laws is that current likes to take the path of least resistance. So if it can help it, um, it's going to avoid any type of resistance if it can. Right? It wants the easiest path. Or so do we as humans, right? So a good ammeter has no resistance and it should be connected in series with the, uh, with, the, with the components of the circuit. So this is a good example, and this would be a bad example, because what happens here is that because the ammeter, an ideal ammeter has no resistance, the current is gonna want to flow through that, okay? So the current is gonna want to flow through the ammeter, and it's gonna skip our component. And that's not good, because if we have a light bulb there, it wouldn't go on. Whereas over here, if the light bulb was here, it wouldn't really matter, okay? It would go on, uh, it would still carry the same amount of current because it's placed in series, uh, or our ammeter is placed in series. Our voltmeter is the opposite. Our voltmeter has very high resistance. So current wants to avoid flowing through the voltmeter, okay? And that's exactly what we want. We want to place it in parallel. But if we placed it in series, it's going to take up all the current and it's not going to leave anything left for our, um, for our object, okay? And that's something we want to avoid. Okay, guys, um, that's it for today. Fairly short lesson and we'll see you guys next time.